Welcome back to the third lecture of part one. In this lecture, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and big data. So what is data science? We've seen it before in the previous lectures. Um, data science can be defined as the set of fundamental principles that support and guide the principled extraction of information and knowledge from data. Oh, that's quite the mouthful. Uh, there's also the term data mining that comes into play often uh, when, you, when you hear about data science and data mining. And data mining is the extraction of knowledge from data via machine learning algorithms that incorporate data science principles. So data science is the overarching um, concept of extracting information and knowledge from data. Uh, and data science, of course, has been around for, for many, many years, just like artificial intelligence. But again, it's come to the forefront uh, thanks to um, compute power, uh, storage, and in this case, the collection of data. So we are collecting more and more and more data uh, because we are in the, you know, communication um, age, if you wish, uh, with networking. So when we talk about data science, there are three core concepts that make up data science, and you need all three in order for it to be data science. There's the math, of course, because we're dealing with random variables, we're dealing with numeric variables um, that measure something or count something for frequency. There's the computer science, of course, because it's through computers that we are collecting this data, we're verifying this data, we're validating this data, we're manipulating this data. Uh, but lastly, and not you know, in least, uh, is the domain expertise. If anything, I'll, I'll say it's, it's probably more important than the math and the computer science. And the domain expertise is the knowledge uh, behind the data. So meaning we need to know about the data. It's kind of funny, the data gives us knowledge, but we also need to be knowledgeable about the data uh, in order to work with it. And so that's where domain expertise comes in. If you don't appreciate, understand the data, then you can't work with it not only efficiently but correctly and so the intersects of these three these inter, sorry the intersections of these three um, you know core uh, concepts is where you find uh, what you've probably heard of most so for instance um, just collecting data and knowing about the data and understanding the data is data processing, right? So you need somebody who knows what they're collecting and, and how to collect it, and they do it through computers, and so that's data processing. Um, if you then you know, take your data to a statistician and say, hey, can you help me do the analysis so I can infer from this data? Um, that's statistical research, and once again, you need a domain uh, expertise uh, in order to understand what you're going to ask, like what questions are you going to ask of the data? What are you going to test? And then, of course, the math, you know, so the, the statistics, is what actually tests the data. Um, and lastly, uh, is the intersect between math and computer science, and that's machine learning, which makes sense because machine learning is, is a, a form of a modeling algorithms uh, that's going to process uh, or or manipulate your data in such a way that you can learn from it uh, and that's your machine learning now if you do all of this together so you do the stats you do the, the processing you do the machine learning where you're learning from your data then this is data science okay so you must be thinking who is this data scientist to be able to do all that well, here's a nice visualization of, of uh, all the subfields of, of data science and what um, this, it's a, based on a survey and there's a book actually published analyzing the analyzers uh, that it came from. Um, and they, you know, they basically asked a data scientist to describe their skills and, and how they, you know, self-identify as a, as a data scientist. And what they found was there was uh, basically four 
types of data scientists, and that's in the columns of this uh, figure. And in the rows are the uh, the skills, basically. And it's interesting, if you look at um, the, the four different types, you have a data business person, you have a data creative person, you have a data developer, and you have a data researcher. So let's start with the data researcher because that's probably the easiest to start with. Inevitably, it's going to be a, a more the, the more classic description of a scientist. And you can see from a, a, the skill perspective, the business is uh, one of the smaller components of, of the data researcher, uh, along with programming. So meaning that this uh, data researcher spends more of their time in statistics, which makes sense, as well as math, as well as a bit less machine learning and big data uh, and this is what would be uh, described as the data researcher right uh, if you then carry uh, carry on to the left we have the data developer and uh, this the data developer tends to be a little bit more balanced and you have once again low on business but then here low on statistics but higher much higher in in programming and machine learning which makes sense, and then inevitably math in order to understand the, the programming uh, and the machine learning. Um, and this is the data developer. So this is this is more of the engineering type. You know, the data researcher is is more of the you know classic kind of professor. Now the data creative is what I find the most uh, personally I find the most interesting. And once again, a, a little bit more balanced. Uh, you know, maybe even even well no similar to the the data developer and the data creative once again a little bit of business um, but lots of machine learning uh, fair amount of programming fair amount of statistics and then some math so if you compare the data creative and the data uh, developer you can just see immediately you have a little bit less math in the data creative and you have a little less programming but a little bit more uh, statistics okay um, and finally, you have the data business person. So the data business person is usually, you know, most probably the person that comes with um, a little bit more content expertise. So they have a lot of business, and that's the content expertise. Uh, they have very little programming. They have uh, some statistics, inevitably, because they need to appreciate uh, the numbers in terms of the value for their their business. Uh, and they have some math and, and some machine learning because they also need to understand the machine learning. So this is just an interesting, um, you know, figure to, to help you decide or understand what data, the data scientist, who the data scientist is and what he or she will contribute uh, to, let's say, your, your research uh, program. Okay, now we've been talking about data a lot. Uh, and we've also mentioned the term big data. And so I think at this point, let's let's address big data. What is big data? So originally, uh, there were the the three V's to describe big data, and it was volume, velocity, and variety. So volume is very simply how much data, of course, you have and if you have a very 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 large amount of big data of data sorry uh, you could potentially consider it big data uh, velocity is you know what you call data in motion so meaning like at what you know speed are you receiving new data uh, so consider it almost like a pipeline right so how big is your is your pipe that is sending you this data and if you're receiving vast amounts of data um, over time, then this could be considered, again, as big data. Variety is the different forms of data, the different uh, type of data that you're working with. So not necessarily the different variables, but think more the different types of data. So what are you collecting? Are you collecting um, survey information, measurements, are you collecting social media type of information? Are you, you know, all of those are different varieties of data um, that uh, all need to come together in order to tell the story. And so the more 
uh, different forms of data that you're collecting contributes to the variety, which once again, if you have many, 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 many different types of variety, that would be considered big data. Now, typically, you have a combination of the three in order to really stake uh, your claim in, in terms of big data, right? So if you have a very large amount that's coming in, you know, very quickly every day, and there's a whole variety of, of different uh, data types that you're collecting, wow, that's for sure big data. Now, what happened is the three Vs uh, got expanded to the five Vs where they, in, they introduced veracity and value. So veracity is authenticity of the data. So meaning if you have this challenge of um, your data, uh, you know, having to authenticate your data, meaning do you need to check to see that whatever you're receiving is actually valid, true, what you expected to receive uh, because you're not sure about it, then that contributes to the big data problem because inevitably if you're receiving a lot of data, different types of data, um, and very quickly. And on top of that, you have to check to make sure that the sources of the data is appropriate, that it's not contaminated, that it hasn't been hacked, uh, then that's veracity. And finally, the one that, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the data scientist, uh, who's more of the, the data scientist business person is going to be interested in is the value of your data. So meaning that you may be collecting lots and lots and lots and lots of data, but if there's no value in the data, if that if it's not going to make, you know, if it's not going to make a difference, it's not going to make a change in what you're doing as a business, then maybe it's not a big data problem. Maybe it's just a, I've got a lot of data problem and I don't know what to do with it. And it's most of it's garbage. But if you have, you know, a large volumes of data that are, you know, complex and lots of variety and, and you have to check it for, for authenticity um, and it's worth a lot to the company, meaning that it's going to make the difference to the bottom line of your company in terms of revenue, then that's the value in the, in the data. And, the, and once again, that contributes to defining big data. Okay, let me talk to you guys a little bit about uh, an application of big data and uh, you know machine learning and artificial intelligence. So this is, this is the part where we're bringing them together. So here's an example. So um, I'm the chief science officer for a company uh, called ASAGE. We're a medical device company. We create um, a medication delivery device, uh, which delivers medication in cellophane pouches uh, to our customers at their home. And the product is called Carry, and our you know, logo is Medicine Made Simple. Okay, so there's the example. Now, why first and foremost do we have this device? So here's the interest in the data, right? And so what we're addressing is a medication adherence problem. People forget to take their medication and it has a large impact not only on the health of, of the patients, but also on um, you know, uh, the, the healthcare consumption, which means that there are uh, more emergency room visits uh, due to medication uh, problems. Uh, there are more nursing home admissions because if, uh, you know, someone is incapable of managing their own medication at home and they're constantly getting sick and having to go to emerge, then that's a reason to be admitted to a nursing home. And so there's the problem that we're trying to uh, address. So by using a device such as uh, Carry, uh, and here's just a, a picture for you here, you can load the device very simply uh, with the, the medication strips. It schedules it for you, so it, it lets you uh, know when your next dose is, when you're supposed to take your medication, and then alarms for you, and you and you just simply press the button and it delivers it for you, and you get the pouch with all the medications you need when you need it, and there you go. That's a, a way to manage your, your medication. Now, what if we could up the ante a little bit on data? So we have this, you know, medication delivery device that is, you know, in someone's home uh, or in their room in a residence. And now we can connect it to, for instance, activity monitors or, you know, um, vital monitors. So like um, blood pressure or a glucometer, um, you know, even SATs or something like that. So, or weigh scale, there, there's an easy one, right? So now we're, we've got this communication going, this networking that's going on, and now we're collecting more and more data, right? So we're collecting not only the data for medication adherence, so when they took medication, what medication, all that kind of stuff, but now we're also collecting you know, daily blood pressure, weight, 
um, you know, uh, glucometer readings three times a day or whatever, two times a day. Uh, and then the possibility of activity, how active they are. And we're collecting all this data on a regular basis. So let's assume that 5 million care units are deployed across Canada. This is just a hypothetical um, you know, situation. Each patient has a schedule for their three or more medications a day. What medications are delivered when, what the medication name is, the drug type, the doses, the unit of frequency, blah, blah, blah. And we also have the additional medical, medica medical device data that I just talked about. Uh, and let's say, for example, you know, weight scale, glucometer, and blood pressure. Okay, so volume is pretty clear. We're collecting a lot of, of data from different devices. Um, I mean, interestingly, that's not that many measures, but when you take into account that, uh, you know, it, data can be sent with every delivery of medication, so that could be three to five times a day, um, you know, it adds up, right? So 50 to 100 kilobytes of data per unit per day, let's say. Uh, that adds up to 21 gigabytes of data every hour, 500 gigabytes per day, 183,000 gigabytes per year. It just adds up because there's a lot of devices, right? So that, there's your volume. Um, you know, if you also include, uh, you know, the schedules, like the full schedules of what medication to, to take, the log data, um, you know, think about overhead of, of you know, all, all of the software systems, um, the total required storage let's say per year is is adds up quickly to like 230 terabytes 213 terabytes so th there's there's you know there's the the concept of you know big data slowly creeping up on you right so in terms of volume the velocity is going to be um how many times um you know data is sent to us and so think of it if if we have um you know five million patients I mean, their delivery, uh, sorry, that when their medication gets delivered is going to be across time zones. It's going to be uh, all different schedules. Uh, and so we're going to be receiving data like all the time, right? And different peaks and, and, and valleys in terms of, of the velocity. And so there's, there's an example for your, your velocity for big data. So how about the variety? So, you know, easy stuff, schedules and log data, that's easy data. Uh, numeric data for measurements, that tends to be quite easy. Uh, where it gets a little bit more tricky, textual data from questionnaires. So let's say, you know, we, we have the capability of, of asking patients questions um, on our on the device. You know, how are you feeling today? How did you sleep? Blah, blah, blah. So there's textual data. How about image data, right? So uh, video recognition of uh, medication ingestion, for instance. Um, I didn't take it, this into account in the sample calculation, but, you know, essentially that's another thing if we, if we wanted to go beyond, you know, just adherence, uh, you know, just checking to see if it was delivered, but we wanted to make sure they actually ingested it. Well, we could send video recognition, right, that they actually put it in their mouth. And there's another machine learning, um, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence solution uh, that we could put together. So that's variety. So lots of different types of data coming from different sources and they have to be processed differently. Okay, the veracity. The veracity uh, is truthfulness or accuracy, right? So how, how uh, the authenticity as well comes up in, in veracity. So how are we sure that the data is what it is? Um, you know, in this case, veracity is less of a concern um, and we don't, deal as much with unstructured data like social media data so social media data is the unstructured data it's it's a challenge to work with right um but in this case it's it's contained it's a it's a medical device so it's it's much easier but there would be where veracity would come in is if you wanted to take into account tweet you know social media so you know tweets and uh you know facebook and all that kind of stuff so the last one is value so that's a great question so what is the value of this data that I've just described to you? Well, let's use a, an example. So 20 to 30% of seniors experience one or more falls each year. And the falls cause 85% of seniors injury-related hospitalization, 95% of all hip fractures, and two billion a year in direct healthcare costs. And over one third of seniors are admitted to long-term care following hospitalization for a fall. So the impact of a fall is huge and everybody, well, not everybody, but many people know this and there's a lot of research in this area in order to uh, prevent falls. 
So what causes, uh, you know, these falls, right? So very often it's acute illness. That makes sense. Balance or gait deficits as you age, uh, sadly, that, 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 you know, is something that comes on. Uh, chronic conditions and disabilities, which, you know, sadly, once again, is, is often associated with uh, the aging population. Cognitive impairments, low vision, muscle weakness, and reduced physical fitness. All of these contribute to the, the risk of falling. There are also behavioral risk factors. So what do, what, what do I mean by behavioral risk factors? So you can have um, assistive uh, devices, right? If you, if you have um, assistive devices, then chances are um, you're going to be more unstable and you, you could fall. Excessive alcohol, of course. So if you, if you drink excessive alcohol, then chances of you falling over is, is greater. Uh, fear of falling. Uh, footwear and clothing. So if you're wearing the wrong footwear, you know, my, my mom is, is, uh, she's terrible for this. She loves wearing sandals, open, open toed sandals, but you know, at her age, uh, and with her gait, uh, it's, it's a challenge because she catches, you know, her sandals on, on the sidewalks and stuff like that. So there, there's an example. Um, you know, history of previous falls is associated, uh, with, you know, future falls, inadequate diet. So you're feeling a little dizzy cause you're, you know, you're, you're, you're you didn't eat enough that day. Um, Inevitably, medications or many medications that contribute to it, uh, risk-taking behavior, you know, even even vitamin D, which is you know associated with with um, risk factors. So, what's the evidence? You know, systematic reviews of the evidence uh, have shown that there's a strong association between uh, falls and fractures in older people. Uh, and the use of certain medications. So that's that's not surprising. That's you know very often medications can make you a little bit dizzy, um, or you know unstable. Basically, you're not you lose your, your balance. Now, older adults taking more than three to four medications seem to be at a higher risk of falls. No surprise there. And furthermore, complications related to diabetes, such as neuropathy, retinopathy, and nef nephropathy, likely contribute to an increased risk of falls. Just a quick plug for diabetes. You know, 29% of Canadians are living with pre-diabetes, and uh, diabetes is associated with with just so many uh, chronic illnesses uh, that um, it's it's definitely something uh, to consider. And in this example, uh, the diabetes is associated uh, uh, basically with falls. Okay, so all of this to say, what if we could prevent falls? That'd be a big deal, right? We've just seen how the impact. So with a big data AI solution in place, we could predict when a patient is at increased risk of falls and notify them, right? So put in place appropriate measures for prevention and at home monitoring system, for example. So you're thinking, well, okay, well, why, why would we do this? Well, you know, this medical device that started off on its own and then connected to other devices and we started collecting all this data and it's real time data. And, you know, we just we, we learn from this data. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn all the different uh, conditions, scenarios, patterns, whatever you wish to call it, in terms of when a, a person is at risk of falling. So a combination of uh, medications, the combination of uh, in, throw in their uh, blood pressure, throw in the possibility of uh, weight loss, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, glucometer reading. So where, where's their, their sugar levels? Uh, all of this put together um, can contribute to the ability to predict a fall and say, hey, you're at risk. And what can we do then? We can actually notify um, you know, the, the patient uh, directly, you know, either through the device or through the, the app, you know, there's an associated app. And so there's the value of the big data, the value of your data and using artificial intelligence in order to learn from that data. So hopefully that gave you a good example of, you know, how you transition through, uh, you know, the, the, the five V's of big data and determining whether you have a big data problem. And ultimately, um, also trying to see, huh, is there a value in working with this data? And that's, that's what I was trying to, uh, to help you guys see is that, you know, that piece, you know, of value is critical for business, for industry. Uh, it is, it's 
often missed in the in the world of of academic research where it's almost seen as taboo you know like ooh, we don't want to talk about value in that sense because then maybe we're talking about profit or we're talking about money uh, and that's true but you know you also need to think about the value uh, to the patient right uh, which you know it could be quality of life right uh, it could also be saving the government money right so reduced healthcare consumption is a good thing and that's a dollar thing right uh, so don't be you know don't be too quick uh, to say oh I'm not going to talk about the value I just I just want to do the research you should include uh, the value in your research because it helps you uh, find motivation and drive in order to be successful in your research because you're going to be contributing back let's say uh, to the healthcare system so what now where is AI uh, used, right? So here's just like a, a list, literally a shopping list of all the different areas that AI is being used currently. And it, it's much longer than this, but this is just a, uh, you know, a, an interesting, you know, um, compilation of them. Um, I love the chatbot one, you know, where, or virtual assistant, right? Um, many people probably don't realize that when they're uh, doing the little chatbot uh, online because they need help, um, there's no person behind that. It's, it's actually AI and it's getting so good that uh, you, you, can, you can't really tell um, you know, the difference between just the you know, canned responses to actually now chatting with you. It's, it's amazing. Um, that's just you know, one of, of the many. But you know, the, the other one, of course, is self-driving cars. Uh, wow, that's going to be a great one, right? Uh, and and the one that you know, obviously is is uh, you know important to us, uh, especially in this class, is healthcare and medical imaging analysis, right? Which is just huge, and and that's what I spend uh, my career doing. So this brings us to AI in medicine. So addressing high medical and medication error rates, as well as high cost and low productivity probably sums it up i think i think that is what um, we're looking to artificial intelligence to help us with okay low-hanging fruit ai for medical diagnosis i mean this is something that uh, people think of immediately you know can we improve diagnosis of disease so inevitably there are so many projects out there currently that are, are addressing this issue, you know, looking to, uh, at ways to improve diagnosis of disease. Um, the only, the interesting, you know, aspect of this is that it's probably also the hardest um, in order to be successful because, uh, you know, making diagnosis means you're replacing a health professional. Uh, and that's, that's a big deal. Uh, especially from a regulatory standpoint, um, you need to be sure that whatever you know, software you've put together um, is going to do a good job and is going to be accurate and is going to be consistently accurate, uh, let alone better than, than the health professional that you're, you're hoping to, to replace. And so you can imagine it's going to take much, much longer. It's going to be much more stringent, much more difficult in order to get this software approved, you know, from a regulatory standpoint to be used in clinic. And that's the reason that we don't see, we have not seen yet, uh, any you know obvious software that's actually doing that. That's just you know making diagnosis and and um, and and has essentially replaced a health professional. It's coming, but it's not there yet. Okay, how about AI for prognosis? I mean, basically collecting information, organizing it, in, and to provide insights in order to improve clinical decision making. This is right now a sweet spot for artificial intelligence and you know like triage um, you know prioritizing uh, efficiencies uh, this is very helpful for the clinical setting it's also very helpful for um, you know healthcare consumption um, and inevitably it has an impact on patient care as well because it enables uh, you know, the, the system to focus on where it needs to focus at a given moment in order to address the most urgent, um, you know, cases and, and, and issues. Now, treatment is a big one. So precision medicine uh, definitely is, uh, you know, on, on everyone's mind these days. And, you know, to allow doctors to recommend better treatments for patients uh, with, through the help of, of data is, is, is huge.
right? Because being able to to know when and how to treat is so important because the population is heterogeneous. If everyone was the same, if there was no variability in the data, I wouldn't have a job, for instance, because I'm a statistician. So that, that would be a, 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 the first big bummer. But, you know, from a from a standpoint of, of medicine, it'd be easy, right? Because everyone's the same. So you know exactly if, if, if this treatment works for one person, it's going to work for everybody because everyone's the same. But as you know, that that's not the case. And, that, and that's what brings us to, you know, what was originally personalized medicine and is now precision medicine. Nice segue, of course into what is precision medicine so if you're if you're wondering you know it's you know the the ambition of of precision medicine is to design and optimize the pathway for diagnosis therapeutic intervention and prognosis by using large multi-dimensional biological data sets that compare uh, sorry that capture individual variability in genes function and environment and so this just sounds like an absolute perfect fit uh, for artificial intelligence, just based on on the the two previous lectures that you've had so far. So where are we at? You know what's what's being used uh, in medicine now. So here's an example of um, a study that was that was performed uh, in order to compare three um, deep learning systems that were put together for detecting uh, TB associated abnormalities in chest X-rays, uh, and this was tested on outpatients in Nepal and Cameroon. So, you know, why am I bringing this one up? Well, this is this is kind of the the sweet spot once again uh, for AI uh, in its early stages, and that is to um, you know put together um, you know algorithms or AI solutions that are going to be able to perform a task which maybe here is not needed, but is needed in um, you know. Uh, specific areas, so namely underdeveloped countries where they don't have access to the healthcare we have, and so there's there's a, a good you know a good application um, for this AI, and that is because th they don't have access to the healthcare professionals that we have here, and so the risk of replacing a healthcare um, you know professional, which is you know here is is frowned upon, um, well in you know, countries that don't have access to those healthcare professionals, then these AI uh, solutions will be very welcomed. And so it's interesting that this is probably where a lot of the validation of this, of these uh, algorithms are, is going to occur as well, and, and is going to, you know, provide the building blocks for, um, you know, future AI solutions that are going to be even better and do even more. You know, another interesting application is, you know, Meadow AI um, has received FDA approval to uh, automatically detect uh, hip dysplasia, uh, which is, you know, associated with uh, early hip uh, osteoarthritis and, and hip replacement uh, surgery. Um, and so this is, you know, Meadow AI works with ultrasound, uh, a, a lot of uh, ultrasound. Uh, and this is an interesting, um, you know, uh, solution where it's going to be silent, right? It's going to be just something that automatically uh, is done uh, in order to um, prevent something uh, negative in the future. So let's carry on with ultrasound. So another company called Butterfly Network has uh, also uh, leveraged ultrasound um, and you know basically trying to create um, the new stethoscope, right? A window into the human body. Uh, for less than two thousand um, dollars, you know, by using um, you know a, a portable ultrasound that can plug into your cell phone. Now they use once again, just like uh, Meadow, they they use uh, deep learning based artificial intelligence applications uh, that they couple with their their hardware in order to assist the clinician. But you can imagine what they're hoping to do eventually is to make this or can you know transition this to what's called digital health where they'll be able to send patients home with this technology, uh, where they'll be able to just, you know, patients would be able to use it themselves and then connect to the healthcare system if something comes up or whatnot. That's digital health. And that's what they're hoping for. That's going to take, you know, quite a long time for it to be approved from a regulatory standpoint. You can imagine you can't just send people home with a with a device, uh, you know, an ultrasound and say, okay, there you go. You know, you can scan yourself. I mean, there, there has to be some checks and balances and there has to be some guidelines and approved guidelines and 
you know, how to do this. And that's going to take, you know, probably many years, but that's what they're working towards. Okay, let's move on to urology for prostate cancer diagnosis. So they've, you know, there's been a lot of advances in in, uh, in prostate uh, using AI. Uh, the, the, just Google it. There's very lots of interesting stuff going on. You know, a patch-based uh, deep uh, learning uh, convolutional neural network model um, has been put together and proposed to classify prostate cancer and non-cancer. Um, you know, from uh, multi-parametric MR images. Um, this is an interesting one, and, and I suspect that along with breast cancer, uh, the two of these are going to, um, you know, be probably some of the first uh, AI products on the market um, for screening, right? So for, for breast cancer and for, for prostate cancer. Let me just finish off here with another interesting application of uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the medical research world. So uh, as many of you know, most probably um, ALS is a devastating neurodegenerative disease with no effective treatments. Um, one of the interesting areas in the study of ALS is the numerous RNA binding proteins that have been shown to be altered uh, in this disease. So one of an interesting application, and actually IBM has been doing this for years now, is the use of their artificial intelligent um, entity, I guess, that they've named Watson. Um, and they've used it to go through all the RNA binding proteins in the genome to identify new ones that are linked to ALS. So you can imagine the compute power that is required in order to go through that is immense. And so to have the ability um, to perform that type of a task in a reasonably short amount of time with relative ease and to have fairly accurate results come back is amazing. And so that's uh, another um, you know, application of AI that people may not think of is that just the ability to sift through vast amounts of data, which once again is a big data problem because you have not only a large volume of data, but you have many, many different types of data. Because you can imagine if you're going through, for instance, published literature, you're going to have the easy stuff, which is the more recent stuff. But then you can also have, you know, many of the uh, of the publications that are in formats that are, are not digital, you know, meaning that they're, they're images as opposed to um, textual, for instance, you know, uh, or, you know, they're difficult to retrieve or they're in formats that are not the same or, you know, they're they're you know, broken up into different bits. And and because of that, they have to be parsed in a certain way. So you can imagine that is not an easy task. And if you were to do it manually or if you were to do it with like, you know, a group of computers and stuff like that, it would take forever. Uh, whereas, you know, by using, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you can streamline the process, you can speed up the process, and then you can actually uh, get better results uh, from your search. So there's just a, another example of, of how, um, you know, AI can be used in medical research. So by all means, don't think that, you know, that was comprehensive. It's not even close. I just brought up a few examples just to, you know, give you, you know, some insight as to what, what it's being used for, to give you an idea of the different ways you can apply for it. And what I hope is that we will talk about um, this in our discussion session. So this is just like a little bit of a primer to get you guys going. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the third lecture, which is the end of part one. And in part two, uh, we're going to talk about how AI can help uh, in medical research.